I'm Dr. Harrison Davis. And I'm Dr. Aisha Dickerson. And you're listening to Two Therapists and a Microphone. Hello, everyone. This is Dr. Harrison Davis, and I want to welcome you to the inaugural episode of Two Therapists and a Microphone. Again, I am Dr. Harrison Davis. And I'm Dr. Aisha Dickerson. This is a podcast about mental health relationship and social issues that affect you. And today we have two amazing guests on our episode. Uh, Today we have Dr. Glenn Smith. He is an associate professor of political science at the University of North Georgia. And Dr. Glenn Smith, he specializes in political psychology, political communication, uh, election behavior. And he's going to talk a little bit about the political climate in our country today. And we have Dr. Joy Harden Bradford. She is a psychologist and she has a private practice in the Atlanta area. It is called Therapy for Black Girls. And she's going to talk to us about how individuals are handling some of the political stress that is going on in our country today. So welcome to our guests. And I want to start off with Dr. Glenn Smith. Can you tell us a little bit about your thoughts about the political climate in the United States today? Um, I guess if I had one word to describe it, it would be toxic. It would be um, you have essentially three groups. You have Republicans and Democrats, those who strongly identify with the political party, and they're intensely active, but they also hate the other side. And one of the interesting things about the climate now is there was a great paper actually by an Emory professor, Alan Abramowitz, who looks at how increasingly people don't actually dislike their own party more, but they increasingly hate the opposing party. Hate is a strong word. Yeah, definitely. And, but that's the word that's been used by scholars looking into this. Is it's, it's really gotten to that level. And it's even... In some cases, there's another paper by Shanto Eingar recently that said it's even surpassed racial animosity because people, there's a, a norm that racial, you know, animosity or prejudice is frowned upon, but political animosity, there's no norms conducting that. So their argument is that it's actually in some cases worse and people are more willing to say that they don't want their child to marry uh, a Democrat than somebody of the opposite race, you know, somebody of the opposite party. So that's the kind of, like, personal animosity. Then you have another group that, because of this negativity in our system, are increasingly disengaging entirely and and ignoring the news about politics. They're ignoring the process, and they just don't want anything to do with it. And they feel like they have less less efficacy, meaning they have less ability to change and have any say in the system. Mm, They lost any hope uh, in the political process. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. So it sounds like there's a lot of intensity surrounding politics and politicians and your political affiliation. Have you ever seen it this intense before? Well, I mean, I'm only 35, so I haven't been around (laughs) uh, long enough. But but no, I mean, this is it's reached it's reached a a higher level now that um, there because increasingly there's been a, a sorting that's been going on where now there used to be a lot of conservatives in the Democratic Party, there used to be a lot of liberals in the Republican Party, but now all the liberals are in the Democratic Party and all the conservatives in the Republican Party, so it's so much more tribal now, where there's no kind of crossover. And then add to that the changes in media communications technology, where now we have so many sources where, you know, 30, 40, 50 years ago, if you wanted to get the news, you watched one of three stations. On television, gotcha. most people, 80% of Americans got the news from the broadcast networks, and they did things more straight down the middle. Now, you know, you have conservatives listening to Rush Limbaugh and watching Fox News and going to conservative blogs, and liberals are watching MSNBC. And the incentive of these networks is not to be down the middle, it's to scare you and to, and, uh, and to bash the other side. And in some of my own research, I've found that um, Fox News, MSNBC, are less likely to praise their candidate and more likely to just attack the I other see. side. And they do it with uh, sometimes, you know, vicious uh, attacks. They go after their character, their personality. Um, they make it seem... It, their, their economic incentive is to make it seem like the other side are, you know, monsters and dangerous. And so if you constantly get that, and most of those partisans are, are watching or listening or reading those outlets... 
that infects the debate. That it's how can you trust somebody if their motives are all nefarious? Gotcha. So it sounds like the media is playing a part in people choosing sides、mm-hmm. uh, with the political process, and that's feeding some of this intensity、uh, and the hostility that people are feeling right now. And it sounds like some people are are benefiting from this process. Can you talk a little bit about that? Oh yeah.、Um, because if you look at the people who are most afraid of the other side of the other party. Those are the people that are most likely to be politically active, to get involved in a campaign, to attend a rally, and to donate money, gotcha, and to vote. But donating money, so politicians, elected officials, have this perverse incentive now to make you more afraid than you need to be. This used to be something that interest groups did for a long time. They would try to make you seem like you know the NRA wanted to make everybody think that the government was going to come take away your guns, right? Because they had an incentive. The more afraid, you know, pick on the NRA, but promoting I mean, fear. Yeah, because then you're going to donate. They can't come out and say everything's okay. Nobody's coming to take your guns because you're not going to donate. Gotcha. Now it's become the same thing for politicians that if they can make you afraid of the other side, that the sky's going to fall. When the opposing party controls things, then you open up your pocketbook and you donate money to them. And now, average citizens, more donations are coming from those average citizens, where it's not as much the wealthy anymore. But like Bernie Sanders was able to finance his entire campaign on small individual donations. So the more afraid the people on your side are of the other side, the more you benefit as a politician by getting those donations. Gotcha. So, Glenn, I hear you talking about one side and the other side, but what about the independent party or other parties? Do they even get to join the party? Well, the problem there really stems from our electoral institutions. The primary system is set up to where the independents usually just don't vote in primaries. And in some states, they're actually forbidden from voting in primaries. Really? Because If there's a closed primary and you're registered as an independent legally, you can't vote in the Republican or the Democratic primary. Georgia has a different system; it's an open primary where you can just choose.、Um, but in those primaries, usually, even in open primary states like ours, like Georgia, you end up having only Republicans and only Democrats voting in the primaries. So, but they are more afraid and they're more extreme. So they end up picking candidates that are extreme, and what you're left with as an independent voter in the general election is you're left with an extreme liberal versus an extreme conservative,、mm-hmm. right? And if that's your choice, a lot of independents say, "Well, I don't like either of them." And this past election was remarkable in the extent that public opinion showed that, and this might have been the first time since maybe 1992 that I can remember, public opinion showed that. People were less happy with their party's candidate than at any time since maybe 1992. But they weren't asking the same question, so it's hard to compare it. But it was remarkable how many Democrats were going to vote for Hillary, but didn't really like her all that much, and how many Republicans voted for Trump, but didn't really like him all that much. And I think that's fascinating. That the primary process is controlled by groups that aren't representative of the larger party, and it was especially independents who didn't. Um, identify with either party that were really turned off by the two candidates, and that's why you ended up seeing some groups, particularly some Democratic groups, turned out less and just didn't show up. It sounds like a number of people were not exactly voting for a candidate, but it, they were voting against、exactly. some other candidate.、Right. Exactly. Gotcha. So I heard you mention some words that really caught my eye. I heard fear, I heard hostility, and I heard how some of the politicians are benefiting from this、um, promotion of fear. But tell us about how the voters are really feeling. Do you have any ideas about that?、Um, I think the the I mean I can just look at aggregate public opinion polls, and there have been a number of of study. Gallup is looking increasingly at happiness and. Like fear and and distrust, and it's all of a sudden after the election was actually remarkable that, for instance, Republicans' economic confidence in just a matter of a month between their measurements just shot up. Gotcha. And then Democrats didn't really become less confident about the economy, but all of a sudden Republicans thought the economy was doing better when there really wasn't any change at all. Just now, Republicans are in control. So that's the kind of this. That's how it can affect so many of our other decisions. I mean, there's there's tons of research showing that、um, partisans have a warped view of the economy because they fear what the other side's going to do. 
that you had during the, uh, just after Barack Obama was elected in 2008, this happened, that Republicans, I mean, you had Glenn Beck saying, you know, take your money out of the stock market and buy gold, mm. right, because the economy is going to keep getting worse, yeah. right? Well, obviously, it didn't happen. It's yeah. gotten a lot better, and the stock market's done well, and now you have Democrats saying, well, Trump's going to ruin the whole thing, right? He's yes. going to take, and that's, it can really affect your economic decisions and your pocketbook decisions, and it's a dangerous thing to, to allow that to happen, that... So uh, my advice is, you know, make your, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't mean the economy is not going to get worse. I'm not saying, I'm not an economist. Mm -hmm. But make your decisions based on real indicators and not your perceptions of what the, the country, what the president's going to do. Um, because we have very biased perceptions of others. I don't know if I really answered your question. No, you answered the question perfectly. I just wanted to know about how the general public is responding to all of this fear and this hostility because it sounds like there are some other individuals pulling the strings and manipulating the public to convince them to vote a certain way, not necessarily for a candidate, but against the candidate. So I wanted to hear your ideas about that, and you gave us information. I, uh, I think one more, one more thing is it seems like right now Democrats... You know, in 2009, when Obama took over, it was really the reverse. And it's so remarkable to have lived through both of those things and have my, my Republican friends apocalyptic that yeah. Obama got elected. And yes, I remember. It's, it's, the, it's the reverse. Yes. It's, it's remarkable that now Democrats are so worried. They really think the sky's going to fall. Um, and so, I mean, if I go on my Facebook and get the more qualitative comments, it's just like every day there's just – you're being – deluged with these articles, yeah. and a lot of them are from websites that I've never even heard of before. And so we're it, not even sure if it's accurate information. It isn't. I mean, a lot of times it's not. But if it confirms, you know, one of the biases in human cognition is when it confirms our views, we tend to just uncritically accept it. And that's dangerous when you have these media outlets that are in, trying to instill fear and even promoting misinformation at times. But if we want to believe it, then we just accept it. Um, and that's another further uh, contributor to this fear. Just this past January, the American Psychological Association conducted a survey of people in the United States. The goal was to stress the level of stress associated with politics in the recent presidential election. 57 percent, that's more than half of Americans, indicated the current political climate as a significant source of stress. 49 percent specifically say the outcome of the presidential election is a significant source of stress. Joy, why don't you tell us what you're seeing in practice currently? Absolutely, absolutely. So I've definitely seen an increase in my clients, um, even clients who didn't initially come in related to stress and anxiety. Mm -hmm. um, that definitely has been a part of our conversations and the work that we've been doing now. Um, but I've also gained new clients who have come in specifically related to stress and kind of feeling like I don't know what is going on in the world and I'm not sure really how to keep myself safe. Okay. What are some of their specific fears? Um, so some fears are around, like, education. Okay. Um, so I've definitely been seeing a lot of that as I have a lot of moms. Um, so, mm -hmm. like, what is the education system going to be like for my children? Um, definitely increases in microaggressions um, in, like, education systems. So, like, my grad students um, will be stressed about things going on on campus or if a group is kind of... Um, organizing a rally kind of in support of Trump or in support of the Republican Party, then there's this hostility on campus that feels right. palpable. Um, so, you know, things like that, just a lot of like increased microaggressions for a lot of people. Yeah, I think that kind of go goes in line with what Glenn was saying, the divide, even I think we're seeing children who don't know a lot about politics. You know, they're not even at an age where they can declare that they're a Democrat or a, or a Republican can at least say, you know, I support Trump probably because my parents do and you support whoever you support. And I'm going to be against you in the school. We've seen a lot of bullying on TV and in the news. And although I don't currently practice with clients is something that I've heard a lot of students stressing about in our classes before I can even start to lecture. Absolutely. And it seems like there's a lot of social segregation between individuals depending on their political affiliation. Um, are you seeing how people are being treated or they are afraid to reveal some of their true thoughts? 
I can't say that I've necessarily seen that in my practice, um, but in observing like social media and, you know, conversations with friends, um, like even around the holidays, like there was a lot of anxiety about how to go home when you know your grandparents voted a certain way. I see. You know, so there was just a lot of anxiety and like geez, these random conversations that you just wouldn't ever expect to have to have. Um, but people were very like a lot of the podcasts I listen to, people would write into the host to ask their advice about how do I go home and, you know, talk to my aunt who I know is a Trump supporter um, or, or I don't even want to go home. How to you know? smooth so, things over. Yeah, right? yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Or people being afraid to even ask their friends like how they voted and, you know, even causing some separation in friendship circles. Gotcha. So take us back to the election week back in November, because <laughs> uh, I can remember and I want to hear your experiences, because in my private practice, for that week, uh, people were coming in, like you mentioned before, regardless of what was going on, you know, infidelity in their marriage or their teenage son got a DUI. They didn't want to talk about those things. They wanted to talk about the election. So that Wednesday and Thursday and Friday after the election, that's all I heard about. And I wasn't really prepared with any type of response, you know, for some of my clients. What was your week like? Uh, immediately after the election with your clients. Yeah. So the thing I remember most vividly is that I was actually running a DBT group. Um, and tell us what the, that is. Um, dialectical behavior therapy, um, most specifically used for people with like severe trauma and borderline personality disorder. Gotcha. Um, so I was running a DB, DBT group on that Wednesday after the election. Wow. And so I already knew what that was going to be like, um, but the experience of being in the room with other people who were um, struggling with what had happened, it was very palpable. Um, and, and even though people didn't necessarily share what, you know, how they voted or their political leanings, you could just feel the heaviness. Um, and I think that's what the week felt like for me in general is just very heavy. You know, Glenn talked about um, like this sky is falling kind of feeling. And that's what it, it felt like. This for fear me. of uncertainty. Yeah. And what does this what does this mean that Trump mm -hmm. has been elected president with no political experience and someone with decades of political experience between herself and her husband, Bill Clinton, uh, was not elected president. So I can understand that a lot of people were shocked. Mm -hmm. and unsure about what that meant about their personal lives. Yeah, absolutely. Especially um, there were members of the group who are part of the GLBTQ community. Okay. Um, and so feeling like, what does this mean? You know, like, does this... Searching for answers. Yes, yes. Does this... Is this going to impact my ability to get married in certain states or, you know, my ability to adopt children? Like, what will this mean even for me to be out on the streets with my partner now? Like, are we going to see, um, and we have, like, increases in, like, discrimination and outright racism and um, other things, all the isms gotcha. that we've seen right. increase since the election. Gotcha. Back to what you were saying about those isms, it, it appears just to me that people feel like they have the right to discriminate against people because of the leadership that's in place. You know, um, do you see that stress levels are increasing as Trump follows through on his promises? Absolutely. I mean, and again, some of this is in my practice, but I also do just a lot of kind of like global observation, particularly with social media. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, like every day or may probably even more than once a day, there is a new clip of somebody being harassed in the streets. Right. So the most recent clip that I've seen was someone in a Trader Joe's somewhere saying, um, talking to, I think, a woman who had an he a hijab. So maybe identified as Muslim, um, like, you know you probably are going to have to go back to your own country now. And the woman said, I'm, I actually was born here. I mean, so just brazen kinds of things like that, that you don't know if you'll be just shopping for groceries and somebody's going to come up to you and say something ridiculous, you know? So, I mean, so I think there's a level of kind of just heightened awareness for people who may, you know, be, be Muslim or may identify as GLBTQ or, you know, anything that can be outwardly discriminated against. I think there's a fear of feeling of heightened awareness of not being sure of what's going to happen to you just as doing something as mundane as shopping. I, I definitely agree with that. And it's, it's so close now that it's not just things that we have to see 
on TV. Um, I live in a very diverse county, and my child has a friend who, after the election, she disappeared for a couple of weeks. She she was um, Mexican American, and she came back and she dyed her hair a different color. Mm. And she said, "We just had to wow. go to Texas and stay with my aunt for a while, wow. and they say it's safe now, so I'm back in school, but I might leave again." So, uh, so did Joy? Did you ever expect uh, or believe that a political candidate or pol- political climate can cause so much fear and anxiety and uncertainty with people? I don't think that I ever imagined that it would get as big. It's as almost it has. traumatic. It, it is very traumatic, and even in the way that we as clinicians are responding to people. So. You know, typically politics wouldn't be something you even discuss in therapy unless it was like yes. very obviously related to the issue. But now, I mean, you can all across, you know, uh, therapist groups and things like even supervision groups like you're talking about. OK, how do I have these conversations with my client without alienating people? I mean, so it really has just changed the landscape of even how we practice. Gotcha. So tell us, um, hearing from Glenn, there's a lot of hostility, there's a lot of fear um, promoting these ideas for political gain, and I'm hearing how the general public, the voters, are responding with some anxiety and anxiousness uh, about things. Tell us, what can uh, uh, the general public and voters do to sort of manage some of these uh, anxieties and combat some of these issues? Yeah. So, I mean, so like Glenn mentioned, you know, you will see all these random websites that are giving you these articles that likely are not true. Um, I have been really encouraging clients to do as much as they can in terms of disengaging with social media. That's a great idea. Um, You know, because like Glenn mentioned before, you would just watch one of the three news channels and get your news. But now every hour there's a new update and a new breaking story and all of this stuff. And it, it feels overwhelming. And I think it's very hard to kind of. Um, disengage from some of that if you're kind of always on Facebook, always scrolling your Twitter timeline. Um, So so I really encourage people to take some social media breaks. So we have to learn how to filter the information. That is that is not easy. No, to do that. (laughs) No, we we don't know what's actually true or not, even when it is reported by one of the national news organizations. But your suggestion is just to pull back and just not engage it at all. Right. Uh, You know, I mean, if anything really big happens, like you'll find out, like it'll be on the six o'clock news, you know, so kind of this all day scrolling for an update is unnecessary. Like, I think you do yourself a disservice by kind of every hour doing a a check in on the news. Whereas if you check maybe even three times a day, you will be all caught up on what's going on. Makes it all overwhelming. Yes. Gotcha. What else would you suggest? Yeah. I also have been working with clients to um, kind of take back control in terms of what they can control. Um, So people feel so overwhelmed and out of control about what's going on. But what can you do maybe even in your own communities to make you feel like you're making a difference? So does that mean you can volunteer in schools or can you help out at homeless shelters or can you donate like Glenn talked about um, to some of the groups that are doing the work that are interesting and important to you? I think those kinds of things really help people to feel like they are doing something um, to make a difference difference in the the grand scheme of things. I think that's a great suggestion. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you. So what do you think about um, people uh, becoming more uh, activists Mm -hmm. uh, and promoting what they believe is best? Mm -hmm. Uh, We heard from Glenn how some individuals are disengaging from the political process and uh, they're voting against the candidate. Mm-hmm. But what about some of these groups who are becoming much more activists mm-hmm. uh, in the process? What are your thoughts about that? Is that something that you would encourage? Absolutely. I mean, I think Glenn mentioned a great point in talking about people who are really disengaged, but I'm also seeing a new group of people who are rising in activism in ways that they never have. I mean, even if you look at like um, high school students arranging rallies in their schools, and you know, like probably that wouldn't have happened before all this was going on, you know? So I think is there's also like a growing crop of activists who are coming up um, who are really figuring out, okay, how can I um, get involved in politics, even on my local level, to really make some change in my personal community? Gotcha. Very good. Mm -hmm. So you've given us some wonderful suggestions uh, to help people to better manage some of this anxiety that's being promoted 
uh, actively by some individuals out there who are hoping to gain some political power, you know, within our society. And we can see how individuals are being affected by it. It almost sounds like it was a natural, a national disaster, you know, that was a little bit traumatic. You know, I may be dramatic in that description, but from listening to people talk about it several months later, and they're still uh, feeling anxious about a lot of uncertainty, not only in our country, but even globally. So I'm glad to hear from you guys to uh, give us some information uh, about this important information. Harrison, I think that one of the reasons for that is whenever it seems that whenever people are starting to calm down, something else (laughs) big happens. We're starting to calm down. Now my family members can't come back from overseas. We're starting to calm down. Now my health care is being taken away. So we've heard a lot from our guests today. I want to thank them for coming in, Dr. Glenn Smith from the University of North Georgia and Dr. Joy Harden Bradford, a psychologist in Atlanta, for coming in and sharing some of their thoughts about what's going on with today's political climate and how individuals are handling that. You can check us out at www.twotherapists, that's T-W-O, therapists with an S, dot com, or link up with us on Facebook. Just search for two therapists. And I'm Dr. Harrison Davis. I'm Dr. Aisha Dickerson. And we will see you guys next time. 